Hello. So welcome to not the first session of the day, 9.30 in the morning. I think I'm awake. Hopefully you're awake. Hopefully I can keep you awake. Hopefully I can keep me awake. All right. So my talk, do you want a dystopia? Because that's how you get a dystopia. Um, so I tend to begin my talks uh, with the list of annoying caveats that are related to the talk today. Uh, so I, this time, uh, I thought that I was going to be doing a breakout session, so I spent the last about 10 hours straight working on putting together the usual infinite number of high production value slides that I have. Uh, we are at a much higher probability of me falling off the end of a slide or just staring at a slide and just like, I don't remember why this is here. And uh, worse, I realized about halfway through the construction process of these slides that I've constructed the most distracting slides I've ever constructed. That, that might keep you more awake, that might make you not listen to me. I don't know, we will find out. Uh, hopefully I will not get too distracted by my slides. Let's see how it goes. So the theme of all of these slides is that I am extremely secondarily sourced. So hello, my name is Jay Freeman. Uh, I am the developer of Cydia, the alternative to the App Store for jailbroken iPhones. Um, this is an article from PC World where they interviewed me about that work. So you don't have to trust me on that, you can trust PC World. Um, recently I have gotten into politics. Uh, I ran for third district county supervisor in Santa Barbara. I lost. Uh, I then ran for the most silly position possible and won unopposed. Um, but what you probably know me for, uh, for the people in the audience who have surprisingly not a large number often who do, uh, is for giving extremely complicated talks at 360 iDev, uh, for which I am always extremely happy to do because I absolutely love this conference so very, very much. Um, and already, like, the next slide is going to be a total surprise. Let's see where it is. All right. So, I also have a live journal. Now, I haven't updated it in forever. I'm really curious, how many of you in the audience have a live journal? Had a live journal? Some people, actually I'm surprised at not at fewer people than I would have expected. Uh, so, fun thing about live journal is that it got bought by a Russian company. Uh, which, if you ever had a live journal and you spent a lot of your time, or you had friends who had live journals and they put a lot of their, uh, you know, whatever, whatever private thoughts they had uh, in, in their, into their journal. Um, that's what I should have mentioned first. So, yeah, so essentially, I should give you the, the overview of what I'm trying to accomplish here is that um, I, I, I've personally given a lot of talks and I've attended a lot of talks talking about the horrors of various things that can happen. Uh, and there will be some kind of theoretical thought process that, well, you know, it works out great until maybe your company gets bought someday. Or, oh, that's, that's all well and good and, until you realize that um, there's actually some security issue or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to viscerally demonstrate the failure modes of what can end up happening by saying that, look, there actually was a situation where that thing happened, and then here's how it kind of played out and why maybe you should consider thinking ahead of what happens if your company needs to get, uh, it will eventually will get sold. And so, so LiveJournal was constructed by Brad Fitzpatrick, who's somebody who a lot, a lot of people were just at the time were just like, oh yeah, I know Brad Fitzpatrick, I trust Brad Fitzpatrick. And then Brad Fitzpatrick kind of sold it through Six Apart, and it's like, okay, I, 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 can, I can understand and I can appreciate Six Apart. And then it kept getting more and more indirect, where it got sold to this Russian company. Um, and so this, this is uh, from, from Wikipedia, we've got our description here of, um, in December 2016, the service relocated its servers to Russia, and in April 2017, LiveJournal changed its terms of service to conform to Russian law. A wide variety of political pundits also use the service for political commentary, particularly in Russia, where it partners with the online newspaper Gazeta.ru. Um, as with many other social networks, a wide variety of public users use this network. Um, so, you also have to know that Russia, um, in 2014, uh, enacted this, this weird law which states that if, you have, if you're an online website and you have more than 3,000 viewers, you have to register with the government as a media outlet and that this actually affects LiveJournal. Um, and so then LiveJournal was now trying to figure out ways of making it so that, well, maybe if we just don't disclose how many viewers you have, that won't be that big of a deal, um, maybe for the, all of your international uh, people. Um, but it keeps getting worse, right? So 
Um, once they actually moved their servers to Russia, Russia was now in the position of saying that, well, we, all of our typical um, content restrictions uh, should apply to you. So you can't say anything bad about Russia, and um, well, you can't uh, talk about LGBTQ issues because that's like totally not okay in Russia. Uh, and so you, know, you can imagine the number of people, however, who were on their live journal, uh, you know, talking about all of their experiences, like realizing things about themselves, uh, and and now all of that is in the hands of a company that is kind of having to work with the Russian government on all of the. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just kind of miserable. Um, the. Uh, uh, I mean, this, and, and this and this just kind of keeps keeps getting worse in the sense that then then um, so Russia enacted a law which states that um, the, the the data that's stored on 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 servers that are in Russia actually has to be uh, coordinated with the government, and so it's not even like cause the comment I just made about um, people, uh, you know, that your data being on these servers actually that 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 can happen too. Um, so what are things you can do that are other than this? Um, if you build a system that is where, where that is federated, where you don't necessarily store things, then you can end up in situations where you actually do not have to worry about what happens when things get sold and where data moves. So there is a, uh, an, an open source program called Mastodon, um, which is a federated social network. Uh, and it allows you kind of like email where you can set up uh, uh, Mastodon servers, but you don't have to use one you run. You can, you can use one that somebody else runs. And, and then you can essentially have a, a system that's more decentralized and a little bit more immune to some of these problems. Um, and so that's the other thing I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to provide some examples of things that might be somewhat better. Uh, in some cases, I'm not certain if they will, if they will feel all that much better, but we will, we will, we will, we will try this. Um, all right. So. An issue that I, I end up having a lot um, is with social media networks uh, and the type of, when they actually are in control of the data and they're in control of the presentation of the data, the kinds of content restrictions they end up putting in place. Uh, this is actually something that was kind of touched on in Mike's talk uh, yesterday. Um, but uh, it actually is, it is it's not just a matter of if you're in the United States, we're all happy and good here. There are also things that are weirdly broken in the United States that our United States vision of morality or laws end up causing horrible issues with. Um, one of which is depictions of female breasts. Um, so Instagram has been in this like weird multi-year long war um, where they will be banning people who, will, who are posting photos breastfeeding and then they'll, they'll be like a massive resistance and then they'll apologize and supposedly it's all fine until like it happens again. Uh, a year later during World Breastfeeding Week. And you're like, this is like the worst time for them to have tried to pull this sort of thing. And then you've got to have the massive uprising again. And um, there's something about when, when you give a company control over all of this content that they're essentially now in the position where they, they, they feel like they have to figure out how to police everything. And they kind of do have to police things, right? Because, because on the other side of it, you end up with, with the horror of Mike's talk yesterday, which maybe I have a slide about. Uh, no, this is more about Facebook. You end up with the horror of Mike's talk yesterday, where you end up with things that are just totally unfiltered, and then you've got you, you've got the problem of of how do you end up balancing that. Um, so, it's not just Instagram. Uh, Facebook has also been doing this thing specifically with you know breastfeeding. But it's not just about breastfeeding. Uh, it's also um, so there was a um, uh, there's an event called Dykes on Bikes, and uh, people who are posting about their experience going to Dykes on Bikes. Um, we're getting their content uh, removed from Facebook because they use the word dyke. Um, I, I, some of my friends um, were posting about how they, 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 their content was removed and then they had these little posts from Facebook that said that your content was removed on accident. We have reinstated your content at some point later after they sit around and complain and complain and complain about it. Um, this is the slide about Mike's issue yesterday, yeah. So you also though can end up with this issue where you have just like weirdly widespread abuse. This is actually a, a friend of mine who writes for um, Android Central, um, who ended up in a situation where his daughter, um, uh, had, there were photos that were taken of her and then they were spread on, um, uh, they were spread on Instagram. And it was nearly impossible to get these photos off Instagram. This is an article that he wrote on the website. This is all like, he, he made this a very, very public um, uh, uh, issue um, about it. Um, this is like the news article, Android Central, and this was an article about it. Um, and so I think it's in here. Uh, yeah, so um, these accounts are easy to find and clearly violate the terms of use for the service. But in my personal experience, Instagram waited for 15 individual reports of abuse to, to act. 
Um, and so that, that kind of that timeline that Mike was mentioning yesterday of like the balancing act between the speed of things getting removed versus the speed of things um, uh, getting created. You also have the weird problem of the speed of things getting removed that you want removed versus the speed of things getting removed that you didn't want removed. And it almost seems weirdly faster that the things that we don't want removed get removed than the things that we really want to get removed just seem to not get removed. Um, so you can then end up with there's some more more complicated issues. Um, so uh, YouTube has gone on a on an attempt to to st um, stop the spread of videos that promote um, essentially terrorism. Um, but in the process, they have also been removing a lot of the document the documentation that has been put together about war crimes that have occurred in countries like Syria. Um, they they've been running afoul of essentially people who have just had the only archive of some of some of the actual like on the scene footage of things that have occurred um, getting 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 taken down, um, including evidence used in the Chelsea Manning court case and videos documenting the destruction of ancient artifacts by the Islamic State of Syria. Um, it's it's. Uh, you know, kind of a complicated scenario there, uh, and, and is something that Facebook has tried to tackle by having uh, really complicated algorithms as, as is YouTube. Um, and this is where you now you start seeing Facebook really trying to like crack down on hate speech, and they've essentially made the problem worse because they've made it so the people who are trying to describe the hate speech that they encounter every day are unable to do that because in order to describe the hate speech that they encountered that day, like that they personally experienced and are trying to like explain to people, well, that's, that's the, them using bad words, and then they end up getting their accounts get pulled, and it ends up just cycling into more of the horror. So now this, by the way, really was not intending to turn into some kind of like Mastodon advertisement, but it just so turns out that this actually is something that Mastodon specifically was trying to look at, is um, what if you essentially try to federate the process of how content um, um, uh, management works? So I, I think that the core thing that you end up seeing in a lot of these systems is that by giving other people a voice, by, by making it so that um, it's easy to um, uh, post content publicly that a lot of other people end up seeing in a centralized mechanism, um, you start having to more personally sit there and become the arbiter. And if you host something that other people are moderating, you also end up in that position. Whereas if you are in the position where you can instead um, kind of separate out the sec sec sections, which for example, Facebook sort of does with groups, but you can make those groups be hosted by different sub-communities of hosters. You can essentially um, also splinter the problem of how content moderation works. And so it can be very easy to have a large group of people who have laws about, like not law, um, rules on their system about um, not spreading hate speech, being um, not, not um, uh, uh, supporting um, uh, neo-Nazi activities, things like that, um, while at the same time um, not yourself having to sit in the position constantly of well, what laws and, and, and issues do I particularly have, and if somebody is upset that I even removed something that other people thought was bad, et cetera, you can kind of like isolate yourself from having to make those decisions, and I think the more you can isolate yourself and put that back in the hands of the people who are themselves being affected, the better you can do. Um, another example of this, I, I, I personally really like the existence of client-side email spam filters. Um, when you, when uh, client-side email spam filters and client-side email abuse filters allow people to actually set up rules that affect that that are based on they're tailored to their interests uh, and their um, and their needs. Um, whereas if you try to centralize all of that, you can run into problems where um, you are essentially trying to balance the needs of the few versus the needs of the many. All right, um, how many people here have used the application Prisma? A lot of people here have used the application Prisma. Okay, so um, one of the things that came up with Prisma, actually is the next slide here, yeah. Um, one of the things that came up with Prisma, so this actually is a German news, news site um, that I actually could not find on their news site, the, this, this, this uh, video, because I think it was in English, and so they only posted it to their English Twitter account and not on there, but, um, so, but, but this is a Twitter post, which is there, um, just kind of bringing up that people were concerned about privacy. So the way that Prisma works, for people who don't know what Prisma is, or even for people who used it, um, uh, or only used it recently and did not, or, or just never really thought about how it works, um, Prisma was an application where you could take a photograph and you could then do one of those Google style, um, uh, convolutional neural network style transfers that Google was um, pioneering. And so where you, for example, take a photograph and make it look like a Van Gogh painting. But they did that on their server. 
And so the way that it worked is you took whatever photo you wanted and you uploaded it to their server and then they would do all of the work in order to do this file transfer and then download it back to your phone. And they never even really made it clear that that's what was happening. It was just like, oh, there's this step. And if their server was offline, then you would figure that out. But if their server wasn't offline, it was actually reasonably fast. It was like only about as slow as you might expect this complicated algorithm to be. Um, but you also have to think, what is, what is actually happening when we do this? Like, what's the, what's the, from the user's perspective, what is the side effect that's occurring? One of it is that it's obfuscating the image. So users use services like this in order to take content that they don't want to show people in the original form and obfuscate it into an obfuscated form. This is not Prisma. This is DreamScope, um, because I, this, this is where my visceral example is about to come from. Um, so DreamScope was a website that Google set up, um, with, because Prisma was like equivalent implementation, but so DreamScope was actually made by the team at Google that worked on style transfer. Um, and people could go to this website, upload the, the images, um, and then uh, get the, um, the obfuscated output. And they also were posted in this kind of gallery, which is okay if it's kind of an obfuscated image. But what people would end up doing is they'd end up taking naked photos of themselves or their loved ones, and they would upload it to this thing in order to get a kind of more obfuscated version of that image. Um, one that they could maybe show to their friends because it wasn't a photo of them naked, it was a photo of, of like, you know, this like painting of them naked, which is very different than a photo of them naked. Um, but now what they've had to do is they've had to upload a photo of themselves naked to this service. Okay. Well, maybe you trust Google. Maybe you trust Prisma. I, I, I would trust Google maybe a lot. I don't know. If maybe I maybe I might trust trust Prisma um, to just have a mechanism where they just essentially never see anything. Um, but you also have to understand how the websites work, and, and you as a developer have to make that clear to everybody. So in the case of DreamScope, there was a very hidden button that allowed you to just get access to the original image. And that's barring, I mean, even trying to find some kind of exploit in the service. A lot of times you'll have some mechanism whereby you'll upload something to some shared database and maybe it's now in an S3 bucket and if you can just change the URL of the obfuscated image, you can get the original. But DreamScope, there was just a button that you could, that you could just use in order to get that. So this is a website where people share amateur porn and this is a person who noticed that and is like super excited by it and starts a giant thread where he and other people on this website just scavenge DreamScope looking for people who have posted obfuscated naked photos and then getting the originals uh, and, uh, and making certain they, they don't mention anything online or the account or anything. Um, but there's a kind of thing where if you search for dream scope, naked photos, you'll end up finding stuff like this. Um, the Prisma, thankfully, not that long after they constructed, did what they really should have done and they constructed the algorithm to run on the phone. If you're going to do something where users are going to um, end up doing something where they hand you information that now you are entrusted with um, that is sensitive to them, please figure out a way to not do that unless you absolutely, absolutely, absolutely have to have it. And there was no particular reason why Prisma needed it. They just had a, had a system that worked on their server and they didn't bother implementing it for their phone. And so now, now that works on the phone and so now it's nowhere near as, it's not a problem. Um, this attitude of making certain that you just try to make things not, you just don't get or store things that you don't actually need is something you should, I, I think, just generally keep in mind. Um, so like at some point, um, the uh, Department of Justice, um, you know, goes to some website and it's like, you know, at some point, I mean like days ago, this is, this article is from yesterday. Uh, goes, to, goes to a website and it's like, hey, I want all of the IP addresses of the people who visited your anti-Trump website. Uh, and so now you're in the situation, well, if you had all these really accurate logs of who was accessing what, when, from where, I mean, now, now you're in the position of fighting some weird battle against the Department of Justice, which you may or may not have some standing for. Um, but if you just don't store that information, you are much, much better off. Um, so like, here's a question, do you really need to store the IP address of users or is the reason you're storing the IP address of users so you know what state they're in? Even if you, don't, if you want to know what zip code they're in. If you just convert the IP address to that zip code immediately, don't store the IP address and store the zip code, then you don't have the problem of being able to track it down to an individual person anymore. It's like, oh, yeah, certainly there are people in this zip code who don't like Trump. Um, if you can, if, do you really need to know the exact minute that a user accessed it or do you only really care for your type of statistics you're keeping the hour? Like, I'm not even telling you don't store logs. I'm just telling you, like, please figure out what kinds of logs you need. Don't leave the default, I'm just going to log 
everything. And by the way, I am so guilty of that that I've actually logged ludicrous stuff and spent weird amounts of money at S3 in order to like figure out how to store all of the logs that I never even used. Like I never even figured out really interesting ways of analyzing quite that granular level of detail of information. But that meant that I was in a position, I put myself in a position where if somebody had come to me and, and said, you have to give me all these logs. It's like, well, I have all these logs, now what? Um, people actually, country popularly, people actually do seem to like privacy. And they seem to gravitate towards using applications that can provide them a feeling of privacy. Whether that application actually provides them privacy or not is a different problem, which is part of what we're addressing today. Um, but um, people, when they're, when, they're, when they're given an opportunity to use tools like um, WeChat, sorry, not WeChat, WhatsApp, with its uh, now, now has an end-to-end -end encryption um, that they, they got from TechSecure, or things like Snapchat, um, which I have railed against before, and I'm going to rail against again very soon, um, but where people feel like, oh, well, you know, this is information that I'm sending to somebody that, that I have control over, people like using those services. So I ran into a situation where I was, uh, I was asked by, uh, it's, not a, it's not a bad situation, I guess. So I was, I was asked by a, uh, a nonprofit in Santa Barbara in order to figure out how we could build a, a system that would allow undocumented people in Santa Barbara County to get information about immigration rates. This is not the system that I built. Um, we had a conversation about the problem that, well, the obvious way of doing this thing, which the way they brought up initially was well, we could have like a text message distribution system. But a text message distribution system is something where essentially, I mean, that metadata is just going to the government. I mean, it, at one point, you could just contact a phone company and ask for random text messages that were sent. Like, that was how little they cared about the privacy of text messages. The metadata of those text messages is assuredly, at this point, being easily um, being received and managed and processed by the government. And they don't care what you sent, even. They, they're just going to care that, well, that this service is sending to these people. Maybe those are the people that we should spend more time figuring out if they're undocumented immigrants. And so we were looking into services like um, Signal. Um, looking into, um, uh, I didn't think about, I, I should have at the time thought of using WhatsApp, um, but um, I had yet to figure out whether Signal could work because Signal has an anti, uh, has, has a, a rate limiting feature. And actually I finally got around, this made me realize um, when I was working on these slides that I needed to actually get around to asking them. And so I finally got around to asking the Signal community, how bad would their rate limiting be for this use case? Um, but Signal, which is um, an open source um, messaging infrastructure built around a really awesome uh, encryption primitive um, that allows for them to provide perfect forward secrecy on an individual message by message basis um, with repudiation. So it's like once you receive the message, you could have forged it from me, but like, so you can't convince anyone else that I sent it, but you know that I sent it because you're the only person who could have forged it other than me. Um, and it has, um, um, but, but, it has a centralized server that it uses for doing all of the metadata management, for getting all the keys um, siphoned off to other people, um, and also for handling all the push notifications to users. Uh, and that service has rate limiting. And so um, if you want to be able to send hundreds of thousands of messages quickly, um, suddenly you can't do it if there's a rate limiting system. Um, WhatsApp. Um, and so anti-spam is something in general that you may run into, and it might be a reason why you're like, oh, well, that's the reason why I want to have all of my data, have all of this data, um, so that I can actually work on anti-spam. WhatsApp actually came up with a way of, they feel pretty happy, and so WhatsApp, Facebook, when they, you know, at WhatsApp, um, figured out how to um, just work on, um, like, not even quite message metadata, but like, just like the, 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 the message routing metadata, and they managed to come up with some, from their perspective, extremely reasonable mechanisms for handling spam. Uh, if you need to build a spam filter, I encourage you to think about it like this. But they also, I don't have a slide for it, but they also uh, spent the time uh, to add a feature for doing mass distribution of messages. It only supports up to like 250 some users, but there are websites um, and like major, major websites. I think I, I wish I remember now, I just, I'm sure I've had the secondary source for the, uh, I, I had a slide for this uh, that I thought I was going to make and I didn't make it. Um, I think it was like the BBC, it was like some, some like giant news organization in another country it was actually use, using it in order to um, send notices and what they would do is they would set up multiple distribution lists and use all of them. Now that said, uh, WhatsApp looks at how many messages a user is sending and will flag a spam if the user is sending an unusually high number of messages per minute, a common anti-spam strategy. Um, I don't know how large these lists that they were actually building were um, and how scalable this would end up being. Uh, WhatsApp has at least thought of the problem. Um, I'm reaching out to the signal people. Hopefully I'll make them think of the problem because I personally think that uh, if you're going to have an end-to-end -end secure messaging service and it is somehow incapable of supporting the use case of, of undocumented immigrants who would like to get notifications about um, immigration raids, whether you even want that to happen or not, 
if you built a system that was designed for um, uh, anonymous users, that sounds like a person who really, really, not anonymous users, um, for you know, secret information, secret communication, that sounds like a use case for secret communication, doesn't it? It should support that. Um, so on the other side of, of doing this, though, we've got things like Snapchat. So Snapchat, of course, is the, the website, or the service that continually tells people um, that, oh, you know, you can send whatever you want to send, and we will make certain that you get notifications if screenshots are taken, and that it will, the information will disappear very quickly, and that has essentially never been the case. Um, so this question that is asked, you know, to the USA Today, and this, this person even just, like, res you know, uh, the advice column or whatever at the paper even, like, answers that um, what makes it different is that photos self-destruct after a few seconds and also deleted from Snapchat servers. Poof, gone. Um, and uh, the, the reasons uh, why you end up seeing, uh, pe people actually will cite that they, they like the fact that they feel like they have more control over the photos that they send. And it's just brutal because you know that they don't. Um, so it doesn't even, like, <laughs> Like the concept is even kind of flawed, right? So like on, on the way that it used to work on iOS is that if you were, you had to push and hold the, uh, the contact entry and then um, in order to be, and as soon as you let go, it would, you, the, the photo would disappear. Um, and if you tried to take a screenshot, what happened is that iOS would just like clear all of the touch events, which made it impossible to, to do, the, it, would, it, would like, it would be equivalent to if the, the finger came up. Um, and they could figure out how to get, sometimes in, uh, some versions of iOS, and they were actually able to just make it so you couldn't take a screenshot of that. In other cases, they're able to detect immediately afterwards that the touch events got canceled, but I can, I can tell the finger's there. Uh, and so they were able to build these detection models. Um, but then in iOS 7 beta, Apple fixed what I will call that bug. Uh, and now suddenly Snapchat is, I mean, this, this is such, people expect that Snapchat works the way that they claim it does so much that this became like news that you would find in the LA Times and the Huffington Post about like, oh, Snapchat suddenly doesn't work the way that you thought it does anymore. It never did, right? Um, and so then I, Apple like, was like, hey, fine, we will add an API that allows you to detect that a screenshot has occurred. Uh, and, and so it was just kind of like feeding into the behavior of making people think that this is actually something that you can do. Um, first of all, uh, on a jailbroken phone, you don't have this, you can just, you can just take the screenshot and you can, like, you can remove that feature. But you don't need a jailbroken phone because you can also just get a copy of the application and you can modify a copy of the application. People do this. You, um, there's like a thing called Snapchat++, which originally was like a modification that worked in like funny jailbreak land, but now the guy just takes an app, copy of the Snapchat app, modifies it, and the users can install it because Apple now supports free developer accounts. And a free developer account can sign an application and install it to the phone. So you don't need a jailbroken phone to make the modification anymore. Um, but you also could always just take the software that was supposed to be running on an Android phone and run it in an emulator on your computer uh, and then take a screenshot of the emulator and there's no way that the emulator is going to figure that one out. Or you could just take another phone and you could just take a photo of it, <laughs> right? Like the entire concept makes no sense. And I was actually really happy to notice, like I had somehow not realized this until, until like, oh, come back, until like, uh, to work on these slides. The FTC realized this at some point. It got pissed at Snapchat about it, and, but then there was like a settlement. And so what ends up happening is, is just like Google, Snapchat is now under some 20 year privacy management program where the FTC is just like constantly on their ass about like, no, did you really do the thing that you claimed that you were gonna do, you were doing? But I don't, I, I somehow don't trust this mechanism because I, I mean, Snapchat still seems, from my perspective, still seems to be lying to people and people still seem to believe things about Snapchat that aren't true. And by the way, it broke again. Um, so now Apple has added the feature that allows you to do display recording on the, on the phone. So that used to, you could either before, you could like plug via HDMI from the output of the, the phone and you could do HDMI recording, or if you had a jailbroken phone, you could just record directly from the thing, or, or if you were a developer and you knew how to do that, you could like, they added the feature where you could like use the um, Xcode um, simulator feature or whatever, you could like do recording there. Um, but now you can just, on the phone, you can do the recording, so any kid who wants to do it can just easily do it. And so I don't, is Apple gonna add a feature that, you know, allows Snapchat to keep pretending that this is a possible use case um, that where it's like detect if an application, detect if the display recorder is running in the background and make the mod, app, um, behavior of application different. I don't know. At some point I'm like Apple, from my perspective, is kind of allowing this to happen by giving half-assed implementations of features that can allow Snapchat to think that like, oh well, it can allow Snapchat to build something that doesn't quite work but they can make users think that it works. So. This might be a temporary problem, of course, because you know Snapchat got all their core functionality people really, really liked, got cloned into Instagram, and Instagram, if you actually have looked at any of the charts for it, has just really been taking off with that. Um, so I didn't realize this one until I was making the slides, and this was actually just a beautiful example of something. So it turns out that Facebook 
um, at some point bought a company called o um, Onavo. I was about to say Onavo. Onavo, which is a VPN service designed to provide, uh, you know, uh, security for your devices and you know better privacy from things. And people use that because it's super secure. And it turns out that Facebook then sits there and it's like, ha ha ha, we now have you know unfettered access to the internet traffic of all these users. And um, you know the attitude that Facebook has always had that engineers kind of just have database access, you know, applies to everything here. And so they will run these giant queries against it, and they will determine the fact that oh, Snapchat is getting super popular, or um, there was an application. Uh, Actually, it was sufficiently irrelevant that I made it not part of the snippets of the thing. But there was an application that I started with the letter H, had a lot to do with video, and uh, they um, and Facebook figured out that they were becoming popular because they saw it in the traffic that they've been collecting and aggregating and uh, and working on from Onavo, and then went to that company and started trying to like buy them. And it's like, how did Facebook even understand that we were like doing anything? Like. And, and it really was uh, coming from the fact that Onavo did this. And, and Onavo is something that people think is something like that you, like life hackers telling people like protect your iPhone and iPad, keep it safe and secure, hand all of your internet traffic to Facebook, do it. Um, VPNs are weird. Um, so uh, recently I've been spending a lot of time looking into VPN technology. And I spent some time at DEF CON talking to the lead developer of Tor and I went to uh, the talk that he gave. And you know honestly there's, People here use Tor. People who use Tor. Um, people here know what Tor is, though, right? Okay. I was actually shocked at like I've, I've known Tor, like what Tor is for a while. I somehow never quite understood a core property of it. One of which is is that so so um, Roger Dingledean, the, the the one of the two, I think two lead developers and core found, co-founders of Tor, um, is explaining during his talk um, that look, you can you can trust you can trust Tor because he knows about two-thirds of the people running Tor relays, and he can just personally vouch for them. I'm like, that seems weirdly centralized. Right? Like, to me, the entire the concept was you had a very large number of decentralized people, and the very large number of decentralized people allowed you to like, remove all the ability of people to correlate and collude on things. But in fact, it's like, Tor guy going around to conferences and meeting people and convincing them to run exit nodes and, 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 and handing them a sticker and then, and then he like tracks and figures out who they are and he actually kind of has to do that because of the thing that I just did not understand about Tor, which is that Tor has a centralized directory structure where you have nine servers that are God. And those nine servers decide who all of the exit nodes are and who all of the relays are and they are actually manually managed. Like, I knew that Tor had a centralization bottleneck. I knew that there was like a server somewhere that if, if somebody were to go take it offline, that Tor would stop working. What I didn't understand is that that, that centralized bottleneck wasn't just a location by which the um, network packets flowed, keeping track of the routers that existed, but it was actually like a person was sitting at the centralized directory server deciding what entries were in the list. Uh, and if you get five people in order to make changes to their distributed directory servers, um, then with those control of just those five people, you can control where all traffic on Tor goes. Or you can just shut down Tor. Um, that's weird. That's weird. Okay. Uh, and, and this is something that like actually became a concern. So at some point, Tor posts on their blog, um, possible upcoming attempts to disable the Tor network, uh, and talking about the fact that they've been they've been hearing that like that it's possible that in the near future that they're going to have these directory servers are going to get like stolen from them or they're going to get okay. So you can then you can go and you can look and so I, there's a, there was a hacker news thread about this and, and uh, somebody somebody mentioned the fact that you, you can just easily get the list of where all these servers are uh, and. Um, then you can all and point it out, you know, where the countries are located in. And so, if you're if you were like you have the United States and Germany were to get together, you could actually control the majority of the servers in some way. Uh, at the bottom here, you, know, you, probably, you don't need to be able to read it because most of my slides here are just like notes for myself and then like verification that this all happened. Um, but the bottom here, I've got the list of those IP addresses and who runs them and what country they're in. And I'm going to point out that the very bottom one says Rise Up Networks. So Rise Up, what's going on with Rise Up? So around that time, it was like like the week after that blog post, 
Um, uh, many of you by now are probably aware that I run a large exit node cluster for the Tor network and run a collection of mirrors, also um, ones available over hidden services. Tonight there has been some unusual activity taking place and I have now lost control of all servers under the ISP and my account has been suspended. Having reviewed the last available information of the sensors, the chassis of the server were, was opened and an unknown USB device was plugged in only 30 to 60 seconds before the connection was broken. From experience, I know this trend of activity is similar to the protocol of sophisticated law enforcement who carry out a search and seizure of running servers. Until I have had the time and information available to review the situation, I'm strongly recommending my mirrors are not used under any circumstances. If they come back online without a PGP signing message for myself to further explain the situation, exercise extreme caution, and treat even any items delivered over TLS be potentially hostile. Like, it's just like this brutal failure mode, right? And I never, yeah, I just, I never realized that Tor actually was subject to this idea of if you just go find these, this, these servers and just, and just like mess with these five people that you can actually, you know, you don't have to do that. Like, their, their protocols, um, and, and I mean, Tor guy is very skeptical, Roger Dingledean is very skeptical of I2P, and I agree with his skepticisms um, because they don't seem to be actually tracking any of the attacks then actually responding to them. Um, but models like I2P have decentralized directory systems where nodes come online and, they, and they, they succeed in registering and then like communicate through other nodes to figure out what the registration are. This is something that exists like um, the distributed bootstrapping schemes that you see for getting onto things like even like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Like you, you're, there are issues with maybe possible eclipse attacks, um, but there's the, the idea that one person can just decide all the traffic. Um, you can do things that are better. So, Army grounds DJI drones over security concerns. It's a fun new one recently. So here we've got that, uh, um, you know, DJI is a Chinese company that makes all these drones, and apparently they actually, their application sends back a lot of funny telemetry. And actually, um, there was a government study that claimed it was safe, but the government study studied a, a drone, the S-1000, while being controlled by a third-party remote and an independent ground station. The guy who did that report checked his Phantom 3 and was like, oh yeah, it's totally sending stuff. Um, so the drone manufacturer's like, well yeah, if the Chinese government asks us for stuff, we're gonna give it to them. They are adding an offline operation so that you can actually run the thing without having it send all the telemetry back. So that then they don't have to actually ever get the Chinese government contacting them for the data because they don't have the data. All right, and so now my, my final guy. Who here's used the App Store? A lot of people have used the App Store. Uh, in 2008, there were 552 applications. I imagine there's at least 10 to 100 times that many by now. I thought I was gonna get a laugh from that. <laughs> uh, so, um, you may have recently saw the thing about Apple helps out Chinese sensors by removing VPN apps from store. Okay, so um, in China, there is the Great Firewall of China. The Great Firewall of China um, is, uh, uh, is filtering all the packets that come in and out of China uh, and um, are designed to make certain that you can't access websites that you're not supposed to access because the, the websites tell you things about either the Chinese government or they tell you things about Chinese history or they tell you things um, that, uh, or, or in some cases, I, I swear that there's some aspect of just like um, uh, financial trade barrier involved. But the, the Chinese government has these firewalls in place and really wants them to work. And so they've now finally gotten around to going and saying that VPN services that are being offered from within the country are illegal. Um, because that essentially makes all the traffic be something that's very difficult for the Great Firewall of China to figure out what's going on. Um, you, um, they've, also, uh, they've also gone to all of the mobile telephone manufacturers, um, uh, not man sorry, all the mobile telephone services in the area. There used to be this issue where if you got a Hong Kong SIM card, you'd actually roam as if you were in Hong Kong from China and your data would go to Hong Kong and leave from Hong Kong and it actually would bypass the Great Firewall of China through the cellular system. Uh, and uh, they, it's like, no, you can't do that anymore. You've got to figure out how to either not do roaming or have all the data go through there. So, Daring Fireball, who uh, sometimes, sometimes I, I, I'm like, awesome, he, he read something I said, or sometimes I'm like, okay, he actually is like on the, side of, on the side of paying attention to these things. A lot of times I'm just like, okay, he's just really excited about Apple. Um, but um, sometimes, uh, like, he was like, there's some great technical information here, but please ignore all of the stuff about, <laughs> uh, you know, jailbreaking, essentially. Um, he poked at this, and I was super happy about this. 
Um, so way buried deep down, because it's a long, long post that he made. Um, to me, the more interesting question isn't whether Apple should be selling its products in China, but rather whether Apple should continue to make the App Store the only way to install apps on iOS devices. A full-on install whatever you want policy isn't going to happen, but something like Gatekeeper on Mac OS could. Keep iOS App Store only by default. Add a preference and settings to allow apps to be downloaded from identified developers, those with an Apple Developer Certificate, in addition to the App Store. In that scenario, the App Store is no longer a single choke point for all native apps on the device. The App Store is envisioned as a means for Apple to maintain strict control over the software running on iOS devices. But in a totalitarian state like China, or perhaps Russia next, it becomes a source of control for the totalitarian regime. By the way, comment about Russia, Russia did, uh, probably before the article, um, post um, the, decided to make VPNs illegal there too. Uh, if it wasn't, it was very soon after this article. Um, now, one thing that Darren Fireball, um, that John Gruber mentioned in, um, in his post, is that, well, you know, there is a way around it, though, and if you're, a, if developers can install stuff to their phone, but, you know, paying Apple $100 a year for the developer account isn't quite the thing that allows VPN services to proliferate and make an, make an effect. Um, what is, is the ability for the free developer accounts to install stuff. And so people have pointed out that, oh, you know, actually, Jay makes this thing called City Impactor that allows you to install stuff off the App Store. It doesn't support VPN apps. And the reason it doesn't support VPN apps is because Apple actually has that API. Do I have a slide for this? I do. As that slide, sorry, not the slide, has that feature gated behind uh, uh, feature flags on their server that they, it used to be you had to, like, email them and beg for the feature. Now they give it out to normal developers automatically, but if you're a free developer, you can't, you can't sign packages that use the VPN profile thing. So you actually, and it's like, like, when I see stuff like this, I'm just like, I start to feel like Apple's just, they've constructed a situation that is so locked down and controlled that they are just now another arm of the Chinese government censorship bureau because they've, they've, they've enabled the, like, the Chinese government to use them in that way. Um, and so I, I was taught, when I was giving this kind of like a spiel to somebody recently, they were like, Jay, you really need to motivate something about it. Um, and so this is not about now. Some people might be like, isn't this a weird controversy going on right now? But it's actually about 2012, where it actually was totally an issue. Um, so back when China still had their one child policy, um, there was a big issue where people were um, dragged to have forced abortions if they ended up pregnant and they didn't have the money in order to pay the, um, um, the, um, uh, the, there's a term that they have for it, but essentially the, the fee that you had to pay the government, uh, the impact resolution fee or something for the fact that you were bringing another child. Um, no, it was this article. Back, there we go. And so it turns out, actually, that um, the internet was a big part of changing this. So uh, they dropped their one-child policy, switched it to a two-child policy. They technically made this illegal. You may or may not argue whether it's still happening. That's not my point today. Um, the, uh, but the fact that there was, um, the internet was sufficiently still, oh, they didn't, China didn't have a good great firewall of China at the time. They were, they were still working on that billion dollar project to build this firewall. Um, and so people were able to post blog posts about what had happened to them and post horrible photos about what had happened to them. And then it was able to be picked up by celebrities in China who were then able to talk about it and, 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 it, and it managed to actually cause enough of a fervor that China had to do something about it. The internet makes a difference there. Uh, and the fact that China now, in the last four years, has managed to construct this great firewall of China that's actually really awesome in, in its capabilities, and that um, there's like there's still some ways of getting around it that like with domain fronting and things, but but with the technology and the software to get it there, is, like to run it on phones is not. If you have an iPhone, you can't run it there because you, you the software has to come from Apple, and China controls Apple. It's really broken. Uh, and, th and this slide was just to kind of point out that like it is. Like, at, in this 2015 um, example of Chinese censorship, they're just kind of so touchy about the fact about these forced abortions that, that books that had talked about people um, who were, um, you know, um, less privileged people who were constantly were like running this problem a lot were actually now in second printings of the book were being told that they had to remove all references to the forced abortions that had happened in the past. Um, so, is that what you want? That's how you get a dystopia. It's like, Please think through the ramifications of what will happen when your company maybe gets sold because you finally do something different and you just can't do that anymore, or you die, or your children take it and they sell it, or think through what happens when you keep too much information and that somebody in the government is going to come by at some point and tell you to give them that information. 
Um, think what happens when you build a system that is, that is so centrally controlled that, that, that a government can essentially use you in order to do their part of their, their control. Um, you don't have to do any of those things. You, you can build systems that are, that are a little more federated, a little more decentralized. You can store just a little bit less data. And, and you can build systems that have just like even the gatekeeper-like level of features that would allow you, like if there was, if there was a, we're just not even having the, the feature flag for the VPN API. Like if Apple just didn't have that, this wouldn't be, the ramifications, this would be so much less bad. So that is my talk. Thank you very much.